Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Well, today we have a woman that talks my talk, walks my walk. (laughs) She's an amazing trailblazer when it comes to female health, reproductive health, um, just bringing awareness of um, natural birth control and just the harmful effects of birth of the pill it's, you know um she is let me just grab my little notes here she is a social worker dedicated to educating counseling and group facilitation in the fields of natural fertility management and menstrual education she is the author of a blessing not a curse and girltopia and co-author of the complete guide to optimum conception the natural fertility management conception kit the pill are you sure it's for you and woman wise conversation cards welcome jane bennett Oh, thank you so much, Karen. It's really wonderful to be with you today. Yes, I was just saying to Jane before we got started that she is, she really does like, oh, she walks my walk because this is stuff that I'm so passionate about, but I actually don't talk a lot about it. But since I was very young, I've been very passionate about the fact that the birth control pill is is just super toxic for women and that we're not being told the truth about it. And so when I was on the search for somebody that could talk to come on the show about it, I found Jane and she's just got so much amazing information on her websites, which we're going to talk about all the different things she has to offer. But one of the things is that you wrote this book, the pill, is it for you? So Jane, (laughs) (laughs) What mm. brought you to be so passionate about this subject? Well, I'll try and give you the potted history. Uh, it started for me, when, which will start, seem a bit scary because I'm going to talk where it started, which was a few decades ago. Yeah. Uh, when I learned the methods of natural fertility management myself for contraception. So they are fertility awareness methods. And I had had a really typical sort of history up till that point. So this was in my mid twenties. I had been on the pill. I had used an IUD. I had also used a diaphragm, uh, which I was pretty happy with the last option in many ways. Uh, But I came across a woman called Francesca Nash, who was in Sydney and she was teaching natural fertility management. So I went along and learned this from her with my new boyfriend, who was very encouraging. I have to add, you know, that was really great. Uh, It really helped because I, I had known about her work, but I also felt, can I know this for myself? You know, can I know this for myself enough to trust it for contraception? And I'm sure that's a a question for a lot of women. So the encouragement of my boyfriend really helped. He was very keen and we we were keen to do this together. So I went home, I started charting, checking mucus, writing down temperature and a couple of other things. And over the course of the the first month and the second month and then the subsequent months, but, but even very early on, it's like a veil lifted. And suddenly I saw how easy it is actually for me to know when I'm fertile and when I'm not. And in those first months, you know, I was still had my trainer wheels on. So there was quite a large amount of time that I thought, well, I I am fertile or I could be fertile in this time. But as the months went by, that amount of time diminished. And it just became like knowing whether you're hot or cold or knowing whether you're hungry or tired. Uh, It was just something I knew about myself. If there was any time where I was not sure for some reason, then I would treat that as a, this is not a time to take a risk and we could use barrier methods. So it's very easy to mix and match uh, fertility awareness and uh, barrier methods. So just back to my story, partly for me, what happened is in that I felt in learning that uh, one reaction was anger. Why didn't I know this before? You know, this is fundamental. And there were many things I learned uh, when I, when I practiced fertility awareness that weren't even to do with whether it's useful for contraception. It was just a self-knowledge. It was just knowing what was happening in my body and also uh, how that matched up with maybe energy levels, maybe uh, emotional states and really, and, and other sort of physical symptoms as well, like, like headaches and being able to say, okay, well, that's happening at that time of the month. What can I do about that? How do I look after myself well? So it really, became, it, it really felt like an essential understanding for women. Yeah. And really, with that epiphany, 
I started working with Francesca Nash and I still work with Francesca Nash and, uh, and really have been on this, the, 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 the ripples from this epiphany ever since. <laughs> Amazing. Oh my gosh. Yes. I know cause from experience that cause my mom put me on birth control when I was 14 and I mm. got violently ill from it. I mean, back then they were even way worse than they are now. They're really high in estrogen back then. Right now, mm. I think most of them are more progesterone-based birth controls. Um, birth control, really, she goes like this. Yeah, I know, I know. There's a <laughs> um, and I remember if I didn't take it at the same time every single day, I would vomit. That's how it would make me physically mm. ill that I would actually start to throw up because I didn't take it at the same time. I put on, I think it was 15 pounds in one year. And this mm. is back in, you know, this, I was a little tiny 14 year old girl just hitting puberty mm. and suddenly just ballooning up. And my mom and my doctor just saying to me, well, you need to exercise more and eat less. You're obviously eating way too much food and, you know, coming down on me. I was an emotional wreck. I felt like I was losing my mind. Like I actually remember thinking, oh my gosh, I think I'm an insane person. I have to go into the insane asylum because I'm losing my mind. And this went on for a year before I finally was like, that's it. I'm going off this stupid birth control pill. And it was like within two months, everything was back mm -hmm. to normal again, lost the weight. Everything fell back to normal. Like It was gosh. so toxic. Mm -hmm. and, I had, and I tried for numerous times in my adult, you know, in my twenties to get back on it. And I finally was like, you was just like, I can't, th this isn't right. And I came across a fertility awareness book and learn my own fertility. And for the next, you know, 20 years, that's what I did was exactly what you're talking about was I learned when I was fertile and when I wasn't. And it's just, it amazes me how much how far away we are from knowing this. Like we, we think we've come super far as women in this world, but in that area, we have not. If anything, it's gotten worse mm -hmm. because now we're going on birth control pills that suppress the period completely. And women think mm. this is hot dog, right? Like they're like, yes, mm. I don't get to have a period. This is amazing. And it's like, what, what is happening to our bodies? Like, what is this doing to us? I mean, my reaction was obviously a rare one. A lot of what's happening is, is a buildup and kind of silent, right? So can you explain, you know, in your research, what have you found that the, the pill is doing to us that we don't, we aren't being told, basically? Ah, well, that's a, that's a very big question and it's a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I'd just like to comment on a couple of things that you've said. Yes. One is about, about the, the changing doses of the pill. And certainly since it first came out, you know, they are lower dose now. And, and some versions, and I, I would use the pill, you know, to cover, uh, I'll, I'll use it as a sort of an umbrella term, uh, when I'm speaking generally, but mm -hmm. sometimes I might speak about IUDs or implants, but you know, it's all forms of hormonal contraception. And as you said, some of them are synthetic estrogen and progesterone, and some of them are synthetic uh, progesterone only. Um, and, uh, and, and they certainly are somewhat lower doses than they were originally. But I would like to say that still women are having massive um, uh, side effects. Uh, because these are powerful drugs. We are switching off a natural function, a really powerful natural function, especially in young girls and young women when, when their fertility is really um, high and strong in most cases. Uh, we're, we're, putting, we're taking a drug, a healthy person taking a drug, a, a young body that's taking a drug every day uh, to, to, to stop that fertility. So we, we, it has to be strong enough to do that. So in some ways, I think it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's more, we have to think of it as more, you know, the promotion and the publicity that, that uses the term low dose. There really isn't any such thing in terms wow. of uh, hormones. Yeah. And one way of thinking about this is to understand how powerful natural hormones are. So hormones in our bodies, and of course, we have our sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, but we have a whole lot of other hormones too, like cortisol, adrenaline, inhibin, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and endocrinologists are still, they have much to learn about, uh, and they 
openly confess that they have, there's so much to learn about hormones. Um, and generally speaking, hormones are measured in parts per million, billion or trillion. So one drop per trillion. And one way to think about one drop per trillion drops is if you think of, uh, and I just read this one the other day, so it's my favorite new analogy. Okay. One drop of gin. One drop of gin for 20 um, train tanks of tonic water. Okay. One drop. So if you think that concentration has an impact. So when we're introducing uh, synthetic hormones, we're, we're adding in a hormone that is similar enough that it'll lock into the hormone receptor sites but the, the companies that develop these make sure that they're not identical because you can't patent it if it's identical. Oh. So for commercial reasons, it has to not be identical, but similar enough that it will lock in to the receptor sites. And by locking into the receptor, receptor sites, it stops our natural hormones and it stops the production of our natural hormones and it stops the feedback loop between, let's, for example, between our ovaries and the pituitary that is telling us, oh, yes, now ripen an egg now or release the uh, lining of the uterus now, you know, whatever, whatever that feedback loop is. So there's an interference in this process and it's a very delicate process. So it, when just going back to your experience you had when you were 14-year-old and, you know, I just have to express some sort of empathy for you. That was would have been really hard. It's it's a big enough deal being fourteen without oh, that yeah. on, on top. And clearly, there was no one. I mean, people, the people around you were only, and your mom and and doctor were only trying to do what was best for you. But clearly, it wasn't a good thing. And um, and and you yourself had to get to the point to realize I've got to I've got to come off this. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think I often say for those women who have uh, initial strong reactions, and some I've heard of some really serious ones, um, some initial strong reactions that include um, you know just just fainting, just and, and you know daily nausea. Um, a, a, you know, really searing depression yeah. uh, that, that's suicidal in, in a really short amount of time. And while I wouldn't wish any of those symptoms on anyone, in some ways they're a blessing because it means people get off it, uh, off it quickly. Just considering the kinds of side effects that women have. And the bottom line is that everyone has side effects. It's, some people have really obvious right. side effects that will affect them straight away and be really clear to them. And others, it may be just vague things that they just don't feel quite right. They feel a kind of a low level depression. Is it the pill? Is it not the pill? Um, and over time for everyone, the, the, the pill or version uh, interferes with the pH of the gut and interferes with nutritional uptake. So at the very least, there is a nutritional impact. So even for someone who's eating, who's, who's uh, using um, the pill, uh, but is really taking care of their nutrition and eating really well and maybe even taking supplements and, and has a good understanding of all of that, it will still have an impact because it will unbalance what their, their nutritional levels and, and wow. where they should be at. So some things, a few things will be higher than they should be and things like um, zinc, uh, just comes to mind immediately and, and certain B vitamins will be less. So less than they should be, no matter how well you're eating. Wow. So uh, as you can imagine, maybe for, for many young girls who, who start to take these drugs um, daily is, you know, they might be, you know, in the full flush of youth and good health and it might take some years for these impacts to start to show up. So in many women that I've spoken to, they'll start to show up. They might be um, immune problems, uh, uh, moon pro mood problems, uh, sort of gut problems. It can be a whole lot of different health issues that might be their own genetic tendency to be a bit of a weakness. Uh, so it's not often not attributed to the pill. And it's only possibly after two decades when they come off they start to find these problems that they've had clear up. It's, 
Um, it's, it's really shocking. It is. And, and I, it's frustrating that all these things are these little things that most, no doctor is going to say, oh, that's probably because you were on birth control for 15 years that you have leaky gut exactly. and now you have an autoimmune condition. <laughs> it's not going to happen. We're not going to hear that. Hmm. Absolutely. And it's, it's not to say, I mean, the reality of the world is that these, uh, these options are out there. And, um, and sometimes, you know, they might provide sort of help or relief or, or a solution to a big problem in the short term. You know, if someone's needing contraception in the short term and wants something uh, reliable, and I'll come back to the reliable in a minute, um, and, or, or they've got some therapeutic issue, and this was a sort of a secondary, in many ways, off-label use of the pill, is to use it for some sort of therapy. And sometimes, not always, sometimes it can provide, the pill can provide relief from uh, heavy periods or very painful periods. It won't always do that. And I would never say to someone, you shouldn't have the relief if, if that's going to help you. But I, what I really do advocate is, and really wish we could support, is truly informed choice. Right. So yeah. that women and girls and girls' parents, uh, really have the information they need and uh, and are really strongly encouraged to to read and access that information so that they're aware when issues come up what they're what they're related to or they have uh, maybe in the case of uh, therapeutic use they're uh, they're looking for other solutions okay well this has helped relieve some of the symptoms for right now how can we cure this problem how can we sort this problem out and that will, uh, you know, the, to me, that's, a, that's, that's going to mean that they're much more able to find solutions that are healthy, that are empowering, um, that can really help them understand their, their system and their fertility and create a, a dynamic uh, hormonal balance in their bodies. Yeah. I, when I talk to a lot of my clients, for instance, that are on birth control, I've had a number of younger women, like in their 20s, uh, early 20s, that have come to me specifically to say, like, I want to get off birth control. Um, you know, what do I do? And it's interesting how I would say all of them had no idea about how their body cycled in a month or even mm -hmm. how to check for ovulation they'll say well do you know when you ovulate and i'll just ask random women that you know do you know when you ovulate yes. no mm. and i think what how do how are we so far away from our bodies that we don't know so many women more don't know than that do know what's going on in a monthly cycle it's crazy mm. don't you think <laughs> oh i i do <laughs> and i think it's uh I think it's it's down to several things, and this is this is really to me this is the big reason why a lot more women don't use these methods is because we've we've never been encouraged and we've possibly even been actively discouraged from understanding our bodies. Um, you know, in most places, perhaps all places, there, there really isn't any um, public health money going into. Uh, really helping uh, girls and women understand their bodies and being you know being able to use that for for managing their fertility as well as managing their health uh, and yet the women who do learn it who sometimes trip over it and then think oh yeah this looks good and, and start to learn it um, I've never come across one who didn't find it extraordinarily empowering yeah. uh, certainly very interesting and a way to understand themselves and a really powerful way to look after themselves. And uh, I think the very simple way to think about it is once we start to have our period, and of course, it's not just about the period, it's the whole cycle. We are then cycling for 35 to 40 years of our life. And not only that, but how we do that, how we manage our health during that time will impact how, what we experience during menopause and beyond that. So really, it's almost our whole life that's impacted by how well we look after ourselves in this yeah. time. And yet we're being told by doctors and social media and everything around us is the message that we get is hide it, suppress it, mm -hmm. don't be, you know, don't be a PMSing 
bitch. You know, like how many times have we all heard that from a partner or for somebody that says, oh, are you on your period? You know, and mm. it, there's not a lot of like warmth and love and <laughs> understanding. And I, I try to really mm. encourage women that, you know, that this is something you need to, you do need to get in touch with. It's here for a reason and it's way better to, and I tell my daughter this too, it's way better to embrace it than to fight it because it's not going mm. anywhere. Like you said, we're here. It's, mm. it's going to impact our entire life, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And so you talk a lot about too, um, like just the connection between us, our periods and our cycle throughout the month and with nature. And I've read a few of your things that it's talking about like the, how it's connected with the moon and the seasons. And can you talk a little bit about that? Like what you found? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and what I continue to find every, yes, every I time love I it. speak to a group of women and girls, it's, you know, we, for a, a way that I often do it if I'm, if I'm speaking to a new group uh, who perhaps haven't come across this understanding is I will, I'll put out on the floor, uh, you know, a picture of a picture representing spring and summer and winter and sort of autumn, or we call it autumn. Do you call it fall? Yeah. Yeah, autumn or fall, yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> and winter. And, and get them to think about, well, which is your favourite season and how do you feel in different seasons and, uh, you know, what do you like to do in different seasons? And we have a chat about that for a while and we can do the same with times of the day. And then I'll talk, then, we'll, then I'll overlay on those um, ovulation, premenstruation, menstruation, and pre-ovulation as four parts of the cycle, not necessarily equal parts, and they vary for each of us, uh, but just, just that have four different qualities. Now, technically speaking, we could even say that every day of the cycle has a, has a, has a bit of a different uh, hormonal profile. But, but basically, if we think about these four, then the way that we can think about it is that we all you know, in any one place, we all go through um, the, you know, the spring, summer and so on at the same time. So we're all in that. Some like it better than others, but we're all, you know, running under the sprinkler as kids do here or, you know, enjoying the, the light nights or snuggling in under the doona when it's, when it's winter and maybe sleeping more, whatever it is, you know, we, we're, we're in that together. Whereas a woman uh, generally speaking, sometimes she might be cycling similarly to some of the women around her, but generally speaking, it's something we experience privately. So when we've never been encouraged to pay attention to that. What are my needs now? What, what works best for me now? The, the most of us, uh, in most groups that I work with, women find it much easier, the, the pre-ovulation and ovulation time, so the spring and summer, when our energy is rising, we're more extroverted, we're often, you know, more, more out there. Um, and we find it more difficult when our energy drops or when we're feeling more, more critical or more easily annoyed um, and a whole lot of other uh, symptoms, you know, physical symptoms that can happen around that time. And we've kind of bought it. To me, this is part of the, you know, we've bought into the, we should be the same every day. We should be the, the you know, productive to the same degree every day. And in, we, could, we could talk about that as a, an aspect of the patriarchy, that the, the, uh, the favoured body is the non-cycling body, uh, although in another sense we're all in cycles all the time, but the favoured body doesn't have a menstrual cycle, the favoured body um, you know, doesn't bleed in this way. And so we've all bought into that. And, and, you know, you can see this system, you know, in the medical system, even when they're dealing with fertility, we just, there's an attitude that, oh, menstruation, or we can turn it all off and then turn it on for you when you need it. Or yeah. it's not seen as something valuable in itself. And I think this does a massive disservice to girls and women. I think it has a major impact on uh, confidence on girls. There's a lot of research showing that girls, once they go through menarche, their confidence drops significantly. Their their rate of depression doubles compared to boys. Wow. Uh, certainly, research in Australia has shown this. And yet, people aren't bringing that back to what we do culturally around that. They're thinking, "Oh, yeah, well, periods are awful, so yeah, no wonder you're depressed." But actually. 
it's how we frame it culturally. We're not, we're not saying this is a really important part of uh, having a female body and understanding it and understanding yourself through these stages and finding what the gold is of each stage. So, for instance, if we, if we are critical of women uh, before their period, when they you know, have, might have PMS or they might just feel more, you know, not so accommodating, not so generous, not so, yeah, I can do this and I can spin all my plates and it's all fabulous. They're feeling often more tired, uh, often, especially women with families and careers, are often more burdened. And yet the gold standard is to be able to do everything. So no wonder you feel irritable at these <laughs> times. Rather than if you know that, then you, you're very careful not to overcommit yourself at those times. And the value of those times is to be able to prune like we do in autumn, to be able to harvest and prune. And for anyone who loves roses, one of the best things you can do for a rose bush is prune it back really hard and fruit trees too. So the, that stage of the month is the time to what's essential here. Let's get rid of some extra stuff. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I've heard too that the emotional, the emotions that come up during that time of our cycle, a lot of women will think, oh, it's just because I'm PMSing that I'm so emotional and I'm thinking about this kind of stuff. When in actual fact, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I believe it is, it's a time that we're, we're extra sensitive. And so it's not as easy to suppress the emotions. So the emotions are real. They may be slightly exaggerated, but they are real at that time and they should be looked at. And I, I now, when I'm cycling, if I notice after a couple of months that I seem to think about the same things during my PMS time, like if something worries me, let's say I start thinking about something about my relationship or in my business and I start to ruminate about it and it goes on for a few months, but it's only around my period time, I know then for sure that that's something that I need to look at, that that's real and that I have to face it. And the rest of the month, I'm just feeling good enough that I can kind of shove it off to the corner and go on with my day. But when I'm PMSing, it comes forth. So I think that, and I tell women this as well as, as you do, that it's a time that you don't, you know, you, you really tune into your body that you are more introvert. Most people, women are more introverted. You're, you're not going to want to do the same amount of exercise. Like those are the times that I do more yoga instead of going mm -hmm. to the gym and working out hard. There's some times that now I just say to myself, I'm not going to the gym during that, that week of right before my period and during the first few days, because I have no desire for it. I'm in pain. I usually have a headache, you know, like whatever it is, I just, I, I honor that rather than fighting it and, and going, well, I need to go to the gym. I need to go work out. No, you know, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the ways um, I have stopped cycling, but one of the ways I used to express it to myself is at that time, particularly just before my period and during the first few days is what really was valuable. And I couldn't stop everything. Uh, but if I, if I allowed myself to slow to the pace that my body wanted to go and to real, and, and that really helped. And I, I felt a lot less irritable mm -hmm. when I gave myself permission to do that and, and listen to my body. And I find uh, I found, and I would share this often with women is if you, take some time for rest, whatever that means for you, whether it's actually snuggling up in, in your doona with your favourite jammies on or doing a little gardening or whatever gives you, whatever gives you joy just, just slowly at that time. It, uh, you know, it, it, it pays you many, many times perhaps doing that another time. And a lot of busy women, you know, some R&R &R could be great at any time. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, especially then is when it's really going to pay off and when your energy starts rising again, <clears throat> 
it, um, uh, you know, it will be that much stronger and that much more positive. So, you know, to, to, to have this understanding that we live in a cycle and there's, there's, uh, there's a rhythm to it, uh, there's more appropriate activities and there's strengths for every single part of that cycle. So for instance, going back to the, you know, the autumn or what you, you would call the, the, the PMS time, um, and I think what you said about that and, and, and your strategy for that is really great uh, because it's, it's often when we are feeling more critical, we don't, we're not feeling as sort of open to everything and, and, and all, all comers. And, and when you notice maybe the same thing coming up, it's not just because it's your period or you're about to get your period. Uh, it is something real. Mm -hmm. But at other times of the month, you know, it, it diminishes in, in importance. So again, as you rightly said, if it comes up several times, it's like, okay, I actually need to address this. We need to have a conversation about this. And you can choose, am I, is it going to go well at this time when I'm just about <laughs> to have my period? Or will I flag it at a, a perhaps more, you know, a generous time? And, and any partnership, uh, you know, the members of that partnership have to work out what's our best way to have the most productive conversations about difficult things. Um, and that might be both people being able to set aside time, um, you know, every, everyone works that out. So I think that's really important. I'll, I'll tell you a little story that I think mm. is very um, illustrative of this. There was, because uh, I run men's groups as well, and there was a guy um, several years ago who shared this. And it, it's, um, you know, I hear many sort of poignant stories from them because this can be our women's not understanding and, and working with their cycle will be, will be, it will impact your relationship as well. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, so this man, <coughs> this man, um, he noticed that he was the worst person in the world about month to month. And, uh, you know, this was painful for him. And so he started to track it and he tracked it for six months and saw that there was a pattern. And so approached his partner when, at the time of the month when he wasn't the worst person in the world. And he said, look, I've noticed this. Um, it's really painful for me. It's probably really painful for you. Can we, can we talk about it and can we work out some strategies? And it took his awareness and his tracking to actually to help her step back a little bit so that they could work something out and work out what would, what would suit her, what would help her, what would make a difference for her. And because we're not encouraged to do that as women, because that isn't part of our, our culture to, to sort of appreciate and work with the, these different stages, she really, all she had left to do was just be reactive. Um, so they were able to find some some great ways to do that. So in many cases, a lot of men are, I've spoken to anyway are really keen to work with their partner yeah. um, about what's going to work and can, if if it's explained to them, can really understand that it is you know you are going to feel different at different stages yeah. of the months and different things are going to be appropriate. Um, and and I've certainly come across men that are really keen to work with their partner. Oh, yeah. uh, around that. My husband said, tells me all the time that the best thing that I ever told him was how my cycle worked. <laughs> Constantly. Mm -hmm. he'll, he'll tell me that all the time for two reasons. One is you, I first explained it to him and I tell my encourage clients to do this as well. Cause I get a lot of women that complain that they have no sex drive. And so I always teach women that actually we're really, you know, some women have a high sex drive and they have it all the time. But more often than not, women will feel sexual for about a week out of the month. And that's usually when we're ovulating, when we're meant to procreate, we're driven to have sex during that week, right? I mean, this, you know, there's variations to this, but just in general that that's typical. And, and just for a woman to understand that, oh, I'm not meant to want to have sex every single day because they, they feel that that should be the, that that's the standard that we're trying to reach because men want to have it every day. Women on TV want to have it every day. So I guess I should, have, I should want to have it every day and there's something wrong with me if I don't. And so knowing my cycle and then getting married and I explained it to my husband, listen, you get about, you know, about two weeks, usually in the beginning part of my cycle where I'm up for it. Like, bring it on. Let's have some sex, especially during this one week. I said, but then as I get closer to my period, I'm not going to be so into it anymore. And if we are going to, then it's going to need to be 
different. It's going to need, I'm going to need to be more affectionate. It's going to have to have like more romantics, you know, you know, things like that, because I don't feel like it physically. So you're going to have to woo me a little bit, but basically don't expect to get a lot of it during that second half of the month. And Mm. interesting enough, you actually feels my cycle without me having to really say much. Like he'll even get a little bit more emotional and crabby and he'll be like, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I'm like, it's okay. I'm PMSing. You're just picking up what I'm putting down. And he'll say, Oh, okay. And over the last 10 years, he really knows now when I'm not feeling that great, he usually doesn't feel that great either. And he, we're just empathetic for each other or something. But Mm. him knowing that, knowing my cycle he just thinks that's the best thing ever because he knows now when to try and come get it and when not to. <laughs> and mm. it works out. Mm. And I think that that can really help women with their sex life to explain that to their mm. partner. Mm. Mm. And, and the whole partnership. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful story, Karen. And, and I'm so glad for both of you. you know, yes. It's really, it's, it's such a great thing to work out and to share at the beginning of a marriage. Uh, rather than, you know, if, if it's not understood, it can cause all sorts of pain and strain yeah. um, and, and guilt and shame and, and uh, expectations uh, on ourselves as much as, as the other way. So uh, that's just, what you've given is just an example of one area that can really benefit by this understanding. Yeah. And I, and I do want to actually mention too, because I, I meant, to, meant to say this, it's not an analogy that Jane's talking about the fact that we resemble seasons like that. She's not using that as a metaphor. I I really believe we do mimic seasons for a reason that there is four seasons. There's four weeks to a woman's cycle. There's, they even say it's seasonal through a whole, like when you look at a woman's entire life, like between, Mm -hmm. you know, in our youth and then in our fertile years and then in menopause, like even that resembles a cycle that we in tune with the moon. Like we are very connected to nature here, people. This isn't just some coincidence. (laughs) I don't think, right? Like, and way back when we would have, that's how we would have all cycled together was you would have cycled with the moon and it was a very, like, you're so much more connected with nature, right? Like the pagans and things like that, right? The women. (laughs) Absolutely. And and I think, um, uh, I, I completely agree with what you say, and there are qualities to cycles. Uh, so we could talk about something as large as the seasonal cycles. We can talk about something much smaller uh, as the breath cycle, a breath in and a breath out. And there are similar qualities. So if you if if you take a moment and really watch uh, the the rising of a breath in and the releasing of a breath out has some similar qualities to what we were talking about with the seasonal cycles and the menstrual cycle. So it's, it's understanding that in a cycle, it's not all up and out and fabulous and high and super productive and super on all the time. I mean, we'll, we kill ourselves that way. Yeah, absolutely. So for, for the women that are listening, like myself, who have daughters that are hitting that age. I mean, my daughter literally just had her first sex ed class. She's 12. And so she's come home and, you know, it's like, okay, what questions do you have? Let's talk about this. And what do you suggest? Because I know, you know, if I went to, if my daughter starts getting a bad period and she starts breaking out in acne, all of her friends and our doctor would say, put her on the birth control pill. So for those that are about to go through this or are going through this, what's, what advice do you have for us to navigate this and, and the importance of, of what it is that you teach? Uh, I'm taking a big breath. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a really big and, and really important uh, thing for us to think about carefully. When one, one principle generally used in pediatric medicine and These girls are still children, technically and legally still children. So one principle is the least invasive therapy first. So let's try the least invasive thing first. Then if that doesn't work, let's just up that a little bit, maybe a little bit higher dose of something. Maybe we'll try, you know, 
food allergy, whatever it is uh, on the particular condition. <clears throat> we consider, we, you know, we're looking at it carefully. We don't want to um, overdose children. Now, of course, we all know instances where that may not be happening and, and people don't have time and they go straight for harsher therapies. And this principle works of the, 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 the least invasive therapy first. In every instance, and it's the principle in every instance, except for when it comes to girls' fertility. And there seems to be a, um, an almost universal willingness to put girls on um, contraception, even if they're not needing contraception, but it might be 50% uh, of women in a study I saw, when they, started, uh, when they started during their teen years, started for therapeutic reasons, started using these drugs for therapeutic reasons. Some of them, you know, immediately it was for both reasons and the others were for, for contraception. So it's, it's used therapeutically a lot. And I'm not saying there can't be some um, reduction of symptoms. I, there's certainly never a cure. You can't cure anything with uh, synthetic hormones. Um, so I w all I would suggest to uh, listeners is just pause for thought. Look for, look for alternatives. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. There has been, um, there was a study at RMIT in Melbourne, which is the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, uh, that found a particular diet uh, really made a massive difference to acne in teenagers oh, if, if followed over a few months. And guess what that diet is? Primarily fresh food. Yeah. Primarily fresh food, a lot of vegetables, no, um, you know, sugary drinks, no fried fast food, um, and really reducing all those refined foods. And it makes a massive difference. So 70% who followed that for, I think it was two or three months, had, had a massive change in their, in their skin condition. So, you know, it might seem easier to take a pill than to do that. But what are we teaching our children when we do that? Um, and the, what we do know is the repercussions of that can be, uh, can be massive. The other side of this, and I'm not saying this is everybody, but I've certainly spoken to a number of women who have told me that once they were put on the pill, it was sort of like they didn't have an excuse to say no to sex after yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I would so, have to say I agree uh, with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is a significant issue. So while as parents we might be afraid of, oh, the worst thing that could happen would be that she gets uh, has an unplanned pregnancy. And a lot of parents think they're doing the right thing and the progressive thing to just put their girls on, on the pill. Um, but it's a lot more nuanced than that. And it, the, the pill makes it hard for them in, in other ways. So I'm not saying I would necessarily, you know, I think, There'd be a lot of harm if I were to say, if I had my choice today to get rid of the whole lot. Um, uh, I don't think we're ready for that. But I really would like people to make sure if they are considering it, that they really look into getting all the information so they understand what the side effects are. Um, and, and be aware that even while some side effects are listed on the inserts in packets of the pill or devices, um, they're always worded in such a way to make you doubt that the symptoms you get are related to this device. It's like, well, depression, but you may get depression for other reasons, yeah. you know. Um, but they have to list them. So do read and highlight. But you've also, they're, they're sort of in about you know, yeah. six point <laughs> writing. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to get your magnifying glass out. But do highlight whatever's there and then put it away, but keep it so that if there's any signs of those things, because some of these symptoms can be lethal, yeah. truly. Yeah. Um, and I, I was speaking, um, and this is sort of a, a you know a, a scary thing I'm going to say, but I was speaking with um, uh, someone who you know in a an emergency department of a hospital who said that uh, who who the woman speaking to him was a um, it was a mother of a girl who had was having um, you know a, a thrombo thrombo embolism sort of attack, and he said. Uh, you know, and, and uh, when they checked out a number of things, it could be they were they were clear that it was the pill, 
that she was taking. She wasn't taking it for contraception. She was taking it because she was using Roaccutane for her acne and they always put girls on the pill as well. Uh, and she wasn't sexually active and she wasn't the sort of girl, um, you know, she wasn't suddenly going to go down to the pub and do you use the word pub? Yes, we do. Um, yeah. And find, yeah. and find uh, you know, a, a one night stand that just wasn't her style. But she was told to go on it, so she did. And this was the impact that she had. And the doctor said to this mum, you'd be surprised how common this is. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I believe it. Yeah. Um, do you know? We don't what, hear about it. No, we don't. We would never hear about it. And doctors will never tell us that either. Um, what do you know about the consequences of what it's doing to our hormones and for, for, for future fertility? Mm. Future fertility, there's, there's sort of varied research on that. There, what we do know is that there is, on, if we average it out, there is a delayed return to fertility. So if someone is trying to conceive after using, say, condoms or after using the pill in any form of hormonal contraception, it does take longer. Now, that means that some people, their fertility will turn straight away and some people, their fertility never returns. Yeah. Or, and a lot of other people, it'll be delayed. So it does have an impact. Clearly, it has an impact on fertility. Um, and some of the other, there's some of the other impacts. And one of the things you mentioned was libido. And we, we can think of libido, I mean, you might not be thinking so much of your 12-year-old daughter's libido, but libido is also spark what we feel sparky about, what we feel excited about, what we feel interested in. Um, and sometimes that's actually sex and sometimes that's, that's life and enthusiasms and projects and what we're passionate about. Um, one of the, one of the well-researched impacts of the pill is that there's a rise in a, uh, a protein called uh, sex hormone binding globulin. Now, the, the acronym of that is SHBH. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's always hard to remember. Anyway, sex hormone binding globulin. So what it does is it, uh, it binds with testosterone in our bodies and women's bodies do produce testosterone, not as much as men, of course, but we do. And it's important to us. So it, by this, uh, something in the pill triggers this response and uh, the sex hormone binding globulin will bind onto testosterone and take it out of our system. So women on the pill or using any form of hormonal contraception will have a lot less uh, testosterone, even though the pill itself doesn't have testosterone or anything directly trying to take, take, get rid of it. But this is one of the impacts. Uh, they've also found that uh, after a woman, 12 months after a woman has stopped, she still has four times more sex hormone binding globulin than a woman who's never taken the pill. And some women, it never comes down. Oh, wow. So when we take out testosterone, we're taking out a factor of our libido and a factor of our mood, uh, our, our, our mood uh, balance, yeah. um, a factor of our spark. We don't know exactly to what extent. I mean, this is, this is still requiring a lot of study and it's not exactly going to be exactly the same in every woman, but it's significant. So this has an impact on us in so many ways that are hard to say, oh, well, you're going blue in the face, so maybe you should top, stop taking this. It's like, it's very easy to say when we report these, and I have had women go back to their doctor saying, well, I love my husband, but I don't have any libido, and being sent off with their husband to therapy, to whole, you know, relationship counselling for a year, and, and then coming off the pill and saying, I can't keep my hands off him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, or, or being told to go just buy some lingerie. That, that will work. But go buy some sex toys or some lingerie. I've heard that one. It's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty crazy that... One, I would say that's one of the most common kind of out there side effects is that it kills your libido. So here you're on this birth control pill to save you from not getting pregnant. Good, you don't even want to have sex. <laughs> it's crazy. It's, 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 it's sort of the way it works, really, <laughs> in some ways, sadly. Yeah. Um, and, and the other part of that is that it will, it, it, for many women, it interferes with their sexual response. So it's much harder to orgasm or orgasms are much more muted. Um, so, you know, I guess 
this, this may be a simplistic question to ask, but would men put up with this? Oh, not in a million years. They I, and would doctors no, prescribe it for them? It, it would not be legal, I don't think. I don't think they would pa mm. have passed it. And I've heard, mm. and this is probably just rumor, it was on social media, but that there was a male birth control developed, but it had, I can't remember what it was, like X amount of side effects, which was, you know, let's say three to the 300 side effects that women get from birth control. So they decided not to put it on the market. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it probably wasn't true. But I'm sure there's some extent, as if they haven't developed one for the man, as if. Mm -hmm. There's got to have been mm -hmm. something. Mm. Well, my, my, my version of that is, and I've, I've been around, a, you know, probably a few more decades than you, Karen, is that I, we have been hearing about a male pill or a male birth control um, that's you know, not, a, not a barrier method, but a chemical method since I was yeah. a wee thing. I remember that. And every few years it comes up and, oh, yeah. you know, we're doing this research. It's looking very promising. We're at this stage. It'll be out soon. Nothing. No, nothing. I know. Nothing, nothing. As if there isn't one. I just, there's no way of with course. the advancements of medical that we have right now, as mm. if there isn't something that mm. could make a man sterile for a period of time. Mm. It's just, there's mm. no way. Okay. Well, and I'm going to say my advice too to everyone is don't just read the pamphlet on the birth control because I think it's really important to also educate yourself in these things that we've been talking about today, which is maybe a little bit more obscure. Maybe you can't quite put your finger on and say, hey, that's probably from birth control pill. But it's really good idea to hear what we're saying, what Jane's saying, and, and getting her book. She has a book about this, and there's other information out there where you're not going to get that information from your doctor, and it's really good to read about all, you know, everything that could possibly happen from birth control. Like, don't, don't go in blind. and Don't put your daughter on it blind. It's not a good idea. Educate yourself, right? Absolutely. Be, be informed. Be informed, <laughs> be informed. I always it's a long that. time, you know, we are fertile for a long time, you know, it's become an expert, become an expert in contraception, become an extrovert in our cycles um, and life will be so enriched by that. I've never come across a woman who hasn't felt that. Yeah, I agree. I think we can be so much more ourselves when we're connected with our psyche and we're not having it um, dampened by the birth control pill or, you know, it's like, like you said, it just takes out your spark. It's, it's crazy, but it's, you know, if, if women can get more in touch with that down the road, you know, I see women in their, in their late forties, in their forties, let's say in their forties and maybe early fifties, where the number one thing that I see right now causing problems in women is hormone imbalance. And so mm -hmm. It starts young. And if you can get a hold of this at a young age and get in tune with your cycle and do what she's saying, where, you know, it's get in touch with the emotional part of that cycle, you're going to be far better off when you hit that perimenopausal phase and beyond. So, um, Jane, I would, you have so many great resources. You have a number of books, but you also have a lot of great information on your website. So can you just tell us um, the, your main websites where people can find you and the and, and your books. Sure, thanks. Uh, it's Jane Bennett, so that's Jane J A N E and Bennett with two N's and two T's. dot com dot au is my website about me and my resources. And uh, another website I have that is particularly about a program for mothers and daughters, and we have facilitators all over the world, but none in Canada yet. Uh, is uh, celebrationdayforgirls.com. I love that. Oh, and But you are coming to Canada, you said. Do you have somebody doing it? Yes, we have a trainer coming to Canada uh, later this year. And if you look at that second website uh, on the training page, it'll tell you dates and, and how, to, how to find out more about that. Okay. And I'm going to put all the links to her websites because she has a number of little different resources in the show notes. So get, if you're, if you're interested in that, you need to, you need to click on those sites and check her out. I went through it all and I loved it. I, she had so, so, so much great information on there. There's articles that she's written about it. And then of course her book as well. Books. You have a couple books, don't you? Yes, I do. Yes. And more coming out. 
Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. You see, you are. You're just this awesome trailblazer. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much information with us, Jane. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Karen. It's been wonderful speaking with you today.